When you think about the Bucks now, you obviously think of Tom Brady, Rob Gronkowski, Mike Evans, and everyone else who won in 2020. And even now, it's Brady's team, so you know they're at the very least gonna be in playoff contention. Right now, the Bucks aren't necessarily a joke in the NFL, such as the Browns, who just find new ways to be a joke, you know, teams like that. Before that, it was the Jameis Winston era, and the best way to sum up that era was his famous 30 for 30 season, where he threw 33 touchdowns and 30 interceptions. Now, many people would label Jameis Winston a bust, but, if you actually take a look at who we actually replaced in essence, you realize Jameis Winston has a pretty solid career. He at the very least got a decent second chance. The person today we're talking about is the franchise quarterback before Jameis Winston. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to be talking about Josh Freeman. Freeman was the third quarterback taken in the 2009 NFL Draft behind the likes of Matthew Stafford and Mark the Franchise Sanchez. That sounded terrible. Right now, at age 34, had he been elite, or if he was just at least good, he would actually probably still be playing right now. As you see Rodgers in his late 30s, Brady obviously, Matt Ryan, all these guys are playing well into their 30s, some 40s. Between the inaccuracy in his game, possible sabotage by one of his coaches, and arguably an unwilling drive to push himself to be a better player, a lot of these things were used to describe who Josh Freeman was as a player. But what exactly caused this down Downfall of a once promising prospect turned NFL bust. Join me on this story as to what happened to Josh Freeman who went from a 2009 first round pick to being out of the NFL completely in just six years. What it do, baby? This is Triple DS. We are back with finally another What Happened To video. I made a What Happened To video about a year ago with Achilles Smith. I even said in the video I would do it every two weeks and well here we are about a year later. Ooh. I've been wanting to do something like this. It does just take a lot of time and research. If you've been following my channel a long time, you know I recently moved. I recently had my first child. Just honestly a lot of things going on in my life that wouldn't allow me to dedicate the time necessary to do something like this. I'm still doing reaction videos on this channel, so on top of all of that, I honestly did push it to the back burner, but if you guys know me, you know I love the NFL, you know I love my Bengals, and I like talking, I love talking about football, so I will try to make this happen a little bit more often, maybe once every month, we'll see. So guys, stick around, maybe you guys learned something, and if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. We're on the road to 1,000 subs, y'all. Hey guys, really quick, this is after I wrapped up recording, but I did wanna quickly shout out Flemlo Raps. He actually did a similar story to Josh Freeman, and I did take some notes from his video and I used it here. So I do wanna give a huge shout out to Flemlo Raps. If you ever see this man, hey, we're both Bengals fans and I'm trying try to be like you every day. Anyway, thank you, shaboy. Josh Freeman, born on January 13th, 1988 in Kansas City, Missouri. New football was gonna be in his DNA. His family was a typical Southern football family as his father was a Division II standout when he was in college. In high school, when he attended Grandview, he set multiple school records, including passing yards and passing touchdowns. By his senior year, he was actually the number four ranked quarterback in the country. And point of reference, Matthew Stafford was ranked number one. So even very early on, he was always getting high praise for his athleticism, his cannon of an arm already in high school and his multiple records a multiple awards which includes the 2005 thomas a silmore award in 2006 he does commit to kansas state staying close to home despite being this close to being committed to nebraska he actually gave them a verbal commitment that he would join the nebraska team but ultimately he decided to go a little bit more local and so we move forward now to his college years where josh freeman was actually a rookie who did end up playing most rookies don't really play that often in college. But Josh Freeman, who just about three or four games into the season, was already pushed in as the starter. Although Freeman did have a rough season, it was kind of expected. He is a rookie who, despite the great intangibles, he did have some struggles with accuracy. And this is honestly something that does carry
carry over, but more on that later. Despite the rough season, he did show some flashes. He broke the freshman record for most passing yards, which was at about 1780, and he was the first quarterback since 1998, so about eight years, to throw for 250 yards in consecutive games. So he was actually doing some really good things, despite the mental errors. You guys gotta remember, at this point, this is an 18-year-old kid. This is definitely something that can be fixed. You can't fix arm strength, you can't fix size. You awesome. can definitely fix accuracy. But going back to those mistakes, he did throw six touchdowns to 50 teen interceptions and a lot of these were mental errors it's just you know wrong read or just right read bad throw nonetheless 15 interceptions is 15 interceptions and he only started eight games so almost two a game they played in the 2006 texas bowl where they were routed 37 to 10 and although freeman didn't play necessarily well if you go back and look at the game itself you'll realize that the offensive line wasn't really giving him a chance so most quarterbacks in this situation especially 18 to 19 year olds we're gonna struggle so it's understandable he got a little bit of experience so he'll play much better come next year and that he did he did actually take a step up in his performance during his sophomore year throwing 18 touchdowns to 11 interceptions and although the team did finish five and seven missing out on a potential bowl game Freeman was breaking more records from a passing perspective including records for passing attempts completions and yards his stats were very very much improved he did drop to less interceptions and tripled his touchdowns. Now, I want you guys to pay attention to something here in this 2007 season. They started 3-1. and one. They finished 5-7, and seven, meaning the second half of the year was a total collapse. One game especially was such a beatdown in such an ironic way. Kansas State played Nebraska. The team that Freeman initially verbally committed to did not forget. Let me tell you guys, this is some the North Remembers type stuff here. As Nebraska beat Kansas State down 73 to 31. We fast forward now to his junior year and this is his breakout moment. This is the reason that he is a first round pick. In this year, despite again going five and seven. Freeman was not necessarily the one to blame here and his stats do reflect it. Throwing 20 touchdowns to eight interceptions. So again, it touchdowns are going up, interceptions are going down. And here's the big one. 14 rushing touchdowns, meaning 34 touchdowns in total to just eight interceptions. Now, a little bit of context. Over the course of his college year, Freeman was known as that big cannon arm, but with not necessarily great footwork nor accuracy. At the scouting combine, a lot of the scouts were saying the same thing. Great arm, great conditioning, great mobility. Now, where he lacked improvement, he had a below average field vision, something that in the NFL is going to be a big deal. WalterFootball.com and SBNation.com both stated that he did have questionable leadership. However, this guy had incredible upside. In summary, Josh Freeman had the tools and the size that you just flat out could not teach. And you can teach that! So most scouts had him in between the mid first round and early second round of the 2009 NFL Draft. This is kind of very eye-opening for me, this next part. Every player gets compared to somebody. He was always compared to two players during this time. He was compared to Big Ben and Jamarcus Russell. Very high upside could be, you know, he'll get you a couple Super Bowl rings and then obviously the bust was, well. Yeah, my personal comparison for today would be probably Josh Allen. That kind of gives you an idea of the prospect that Josh Freeman was. He wasn't going to be ready immediately, but if you gave him time, he could definitely develop into something special. Now, we're going to turn a little bit away from Josh Freeman, and we're going to focus on the Buccaneers in 2008, the team that does inevitably draft him. The Bucs in 2008 at this point were six years removed from their first ever Super Bowl win, and similar to Freeman in his college games, they actually started off hot in 2008, beginning the season at 9-3, and three, only to collapse in the end, lose four straight, miss the playoffs entirely, 9-7. and seven. As a result, the regime felt like it was now time to move on from longtime head coach John Gruden, and as a result, Raheem Morris was hired. It was a new era in Tampa Bay. Some off-season departures for the Bucs this year was longtime vets like Derek Brooks, Warwick Dunn, and Jeff Garcia. In the 2009 draft, the Buccaneers did see enough in Josh Freeman that they were willing to trade up and select him as the third quarterback taken in the draft. He ended up going in the middle of the first round. Josh Freeman was better off riding the bench until he was ready. So the Bucks actually opted with Byron Leftwich. Fortunately, Leftwich got hurt. Replacing him was Josh Johnson, 
Uh, didn't matter who was playing between both of them. They ended up going 0-7. The Bucks go into the bye week at week 8 where they do make the decision that it is time for Freeman to step up. He will make his debut against the Green Bay Packers led by Aaron Rodgers. Despite a shaky completion percentage going 14 of 31, he actually did have a pretty good showing all things considered. 205 yards, 3 touchdowns, and a pick but the Bucks do get their first win of the season. So yes, you know, this is the kid, this is the new kid on the block, you know, this is the new regime. Why didn't they start him sooner? They go on to lose their next five games. Wowie. One of those games specifically was so bad against the Panthers. It really, really brought out just how not ready Josh Freeman actually was. Josh Freeman throws five interceptions against the Panthers in week 13. By the end of the 2009 season, the Bucks are 3-13. and 13. Freeman's final stats for his rookie campaign were 10 touchdowns to 18 picks, 1,855 yards passing. At the end of the season, yes, 3-13, and 13, the Bucks still saw enough. This kid's not even 22 years old yet. And if you ignore that awful, awful, awful Carolina game. You know, now it's only 10 touchdowns to 13 interceptions. So, you know, there's there's something there. And the Bucks made sure that Freeman knew that he was still their guy, as they did go ahead and pick up Mike Williams and Kellen Winslow, who ended up being his top two targets in the upcoming season. So let's go ahead and talk about the 2010 season. They also drafted LeGarrette Blunt in the first round. Are you dumb, stupid, or dumb? Now a year under his belt, Josh Freeman is expected to take a step up, and he actually does. Freeman goes on to play all 16 games, something that hadn't been done since 2003 when Brad Johnson was at the helm. In this following season, he is actually playing some pretty damn good football. He threw for 25 touchdowns to just 6 interceptions with 3,451 passing yards and a completion percentage of 61.4. Maybe it's not on the levels of like your Drew Breeses, your Peyton Mannings, but all things considered, that's still pretty good. And the Bucks do finish 10 and six. Despite the great record and great performance this year, these two things, had they happened any other year, would have been a difference maker. One, the Bucks, despite being 10 and six, were third in the NFC South and missed the playoffs. And despite the amazing step up in his sophomore campaign, he was not a pro bowler. That spot was taken by two people in his division, including Matt Ryan, Drew Brees, and Michael Vick. Now, one game that is pointed at the Bucks more so than Freeman is the game against the then 3-10 Detroit Lions, where Freeman himself, he didn't actually play bad, but the fact that you guys absolutely need to win this game, and you guys lose to the 3-10 Lions, led by who? No, not Matthew Stafford, he was hurt. Led by Drew Stanton. Who knows what the difference could have made had the Bucks made the playoffs that year. Could they have won a game in the wild card? It's a lot of what if, who knows, but the, at the end of the day, 10 and six, no playoffs. On the bright side, he did make the NFL top 100 at number 86. So things are actually promising. Things are looking up. This is exactly what you want to see out of your second year quarterback. Considering they were 3-13 and the year prior, this was an amazing step in the right direction. Oh, but how the turntables, because in 2011, things take a turn for the worst. Expectations were definitely high in Tampa Bay. Our quarterback, who should have been a pro bowler, should be even better. Maybe we're thinking 30 touchdowns. Maybe Maybe we're thinking 4,000 yards. This should be the year it all comes together for Freeman. Everything, the playoffs, the Pro Bowl. And you know what? The first couple weeks of the season, it looked just like that. They were four and two. Freeman, although not doing particularly well, only throwing for five touchdowns to six interceptions, albeit adding another two on the ground. At the end of the day, winning cures all. After week six, defeating the Saints, it almost feels like it's fate that is just intervening. Freeman in college had a great start, collapses. The Bucks in 2008 before drafting Freeman, great start, collapse. Can you guys see where I'm kind of going with this? The 2011 Tampa Bay Buccaneers go on to lose the next 10 games. For one reason or another, they could not get it done. Freeman collapsed. Raheem Morris's coaching schemes collapsed. The defense collapsed. They were losing left and right, and it was taking its 
toll. So this is kind of where I want to bring back what the scouts were saying when they were watching him play college. They questioned this guy's leadership. Do you think someone like the likes of Brady or the likes of a Burrow, do you guys think these guys are going to settle for losing this badly? Probably not. After a certain point, the Bucks are just get not only losing, they're getting full on blown out. They're losing by at least three scores every single game. Yeah, some people say, yeah, okay, a loss is a loss. There's a difference between losing by a point or two and then losing every single game by like four touchdowns. This is a team that didn't change that much from last year. So I can only think of the team or the players just giving up. Freeman against the Bears, four interceptions. Against the Texans, three interceptions. Every game was a blowout after week 12. And the perfect way to sum all of this up was in week 17. The Falcons were beating the Bucks 42 to 0 by halftime. Not by the end of the third, not by the end of the game, by halftime. And it's not like the Bucks are benching their players. Freeman was playing in this game. All in all, a very monumental, huge disappointing season. Things we're going to change. Freeman took a step back in the ratio, throwing 16 touchdowns to 22 interceptions, throwing for almost 3,600. His QBR was pretty bad at 46.1. The biggest issue the Bucks had, their turnover differential was dead last in the NFL. They had a grand total of 40 giveaways, leading them to a minus 16 turnover differential, dead last in the NFL. Raheem Morris was fired the very next day. This is when the Tampa Bay Bucks replaced Morris with Greg Schiano. His first couple of moves seem promising for Freeman, drafting Doug Martin, replacing LeGarrette Blunt, and signing Vincent Jackson. But despite showing in interviews that he is fully supporting Josh Freeman, rumors begin to surface that Schiano isn't all in on Freeman. And it's almost understandable when you are a new coach, you kind of want to bring your own players in. And this is one thing you got to know about Greg Schiano. He's one of these fiery, get in your face kind of dudes. Now, in the 2012 season, can, can you guys guess where this is going again? Ah, oh, here we go again. Greg Schiano and Josh Freeman, great start, six and four. Well, okay, not great, decent start. You're in the middle of the pack, you're above 500. <sighs> they follow up this decent start, y'all, with a five game losing streak, which includes a 41 to zero loss. In that game, Freeman throws zero touchdowns, obviously, to four interceptions. It didn't help when they played St. Louis the next game, as Freeman threw one touchdown to another four interceptions. Meaning, in a two-game stretch with a coach that was not really 100% on board with you to begin with, he is seeing you struggle going one touchdown for eight interceptions in a two-game stretch. Despite the terrible end to the season again. From a statistical standpoint, he did rebound from the disastrous 2011 season, throwing 27 touchdowns to 17 picks. And really, if you don't include those two god-awful games, 26 to eight, actually, ratio, which is pretty good. Throwing for 4,000 yards, so he did break the 4,000 yard barrier. The team does finish seven and nine, but this is where Shiano begins to turn on Freeman. Greg Shiano does draft Mike Glennon in the third round causing an even bigger rift between the head coach and quarterback. And based off of a lot of reports, Freeman was just not having it. Having a lot of tantrums, some people call it diva moments. Some of these problems included missing a team photo. Now, I couldn't find research if it happened before or after, but when voting for team captains, Josh Freeman was not voted team captain. Keep in mind, almost Every single team, their quarterback is a team captain. Freeman insists that he just overslept. I do also want to point out, because Greg Schiano is not the biggest fan of Josh at this point, there were allegations that he rigged the voting. Although Schiano does deny this, it is something to point out. When I tell you guys how much of a big deal for your starting quarterback to not be the team captain, that means you kind of lost either the faith in your coach, your locker room, some combination of it, but people are not believing in you. Say what you want about Josh Freeman's stats. Say what you want about his play on the field. There's something about this guy that, well, 
people weren't having. Should the rigging by Greg Schiano claims be true, you'd think the players would question, well, how is he not captain? And on the flip side, if the claims are false, then your team doesn't like you. I mean, if you don't have the respect of your team to even be a team captain, which is almost a given for your starting quarterback, you're on a very slippery slope. You're on very thin ice. Unless you're playing absolute lights out, honestly, you're probably gone. Despite everything, Josh Freeman does get the starting nod over Mike Glennon, but he does not do much with it. In the following three games, he throws two touchdowns to three interceptions with 571 yards to show for it, but an absolutely atrocious completion percentage at 45%. The Bucks are 0-3, Shiano makes the switch. Not only did he lose his starting position, he wasn't even the backup. Freeman was the third stringer at this point. Along with missing team photos, throwing tantrums, not being a very good teammate, it was also being reported that he was missing team meetings. All these things are not adding up in Josh Freeman's favor. And one thing you want to consider, if you're done with the Bucks, that's one thing. But other teams are watching, they're hearing the rumors, they're seeing what is transpiring. Do you think that they're going to want to put that in their locker room? At the week four bye, Josh Freeman does request a trade. Unfortunately, because he had a very massive contract, no takers were made and the Bucks do eventually release him, officially ending his tenure with the team that drafted him in 2009. At the end of the day, this is a professional team. These are all adults. Yes, you're only 20 etc etc but you need to hold yourself a certain way I do believe at this point because Josh Freeman was always being talked to as like oh my gosh this guy is that dude the number one guy in the state in the top five quarterbacks going into college Josh Freeman was known as this very laid-back guy so it makes kind of sense that he didn't mesh with Greg Schiano, who was this really intense styled coach but you know what this guy 25 years old six foot six can throw a absolute rocket. There has to be a team that does give him a chance. The Minnesota Vikings, who also had problems at quarterback, they do give Freeman a shot and they do sign him a few days after the Bucks release him. I do believe what I'm going to say next is probably the final dagger of Josh Freeman ever having a legit chance of being a starter in this league. This next game that he plays ultimately decides his career's fate. In week seven, the Vikings are hosting the New York Giants, who are 0-6 at the time. I don't know if it was the pressure. Some people argue that he just wasn't ready or didn't have enough time to learn anything. The stats don't even do it justice because if you actually watch the game, he is playing absolutely terrible. And the stats aren't even that great to begin with. Remember, this guy has only had a week roughly to prepare or memorize an entire playbook and you're having him throw the football 50 times for 190 yards, no touchdowns and one interception. Now it didn't help that Adrian Peterson himself wasn't having the best game, 13 carries for 28 yards. Freeman looks confused, lost. He is making inaccurate throws. He's making terrible decisions. That was his one and only start for the Vikings. And although they didn't release him, he was the third string from here on out behind Ponder and Matt Castle. Now reports are suggesting that he was in third string because he did have concussion-like symptoms. But nonetheless, even after he clears, he still never touches the field again. I am trying to kind of see it from both sides. The Vikings who are struggling at this point, trying to find their answer at quarterback, are desperately looking. A 25 year old who showed flashes of being a great quarterback became available. So the Vikings did take a chance. Granted, he did have a week to prepare, but remember, the rumors are suggesting he's laid back. He's not one of those, I'm the first one in, last one out type of players. But on the flip side, I mean, most veteran quarterbacks, even the journeymen who accept their fate, would struggle if they've only had a week to learn a brand new playbook. Josh Freeman has never been put in this situation. Whether fair or unfair, he has always been that guy wherever he has gone. Even even if the team wasn't necessarily successful, he has always been that guy. This was his chance to at least prove, maybe I could be a backup in this league, or maybe I'll get a chance somewhere else. Maybe this is where my career renaissance happens with the Vikings. But one week in, this guy clearly was unprepared. He was not ready. And the fact that the Vikings had planned for him to throw the ball as often as he did, it almost felt like it was a bit of a sabotage 
on the Vikings part, but at the same time, you're running out of options here. So I do see both sides in this scenario. Do I feel like the Vikings should have gave him another chance? Absolutely. He did have that concussion scare, but after a while, you'd think maybe, look, week 15, week 16, maybe you give him another shot. And it's not like the Vikings were playing for anything. They did finish 5-10-1. and one. In the eyes of many NFL teams, this is a guy who had a lot of rumors and question marks in him when he left Tampa Bay, and he only made his case to be on a team worse after that putrid game on Monday Night Football. And look, guys, Monday Night Football is a big stage. It's even bigger when you're playing the New York. Giants. Even if they're bad, New York is New York. So on top of the fact that it's Monday night, on top of the fact that it's the New York Giants, not even the Jets, the New York Giants. So many eyes were on this game and it was on display of how inept this guy was. At this point, there is no more meaningful games for Josh Freeman to play. In the 2014 offseason, he actually was picked up by the Giants, only to be let go a month later. He signed with the Miami Dolphins, even played in a preseason game. But again, this guy played terribly. He was 13 of 22 for 165 yards and two interceptions. After that performance, he was released by the Miami Dolphins. He ended up taking his talents to the FXFL signing with the Brooklyn Bolts in week 17 of the 2015 season. One final team did come knocking. That was the Indianapolis Colts, who were just flat out out of options at quarterback at this point. Luck had gone down, Hasselbeck gone down, Charlie Whitehurst was already on injured reserve. They needed to find somebody, and they did choose Josh Freeman to finish out the season. The Colts actually won that game. So props to Josh Freeman, his last NFL game, he actually won. And his stats, although the accuracy was again just an issue, he didn't, well, play terribly. Going 15 of 28, so above 50%, 149 yards, one touchdown to one interception. A very somber end to an NFL career. After this, no team wanted to give him a chance. The Colts didn't re-sign him, no other team was interested. This was it for his NFL career. Freeman did intend to go to the CFL and eventually did get a contract offer from the Montreal Alouettes for two years in 2018, only to just decide at the end that he wasn't gonna play. Josh Freeman at this point opted to retire at age 30 from professional football. In 61 started games in the NFL, Josh Freeman did throw 81 touchdowns to 68 interceptions, leaving him a 77% passer rating, 13,873 yards to close out his NFL career. So where at this point did it all go wrong for Josh Freeman? This is a guy who had all the tools to be something spectacular, arguably could still be playing in the NFL. My personal belief is that a lot of it had to do with the fact that his teams just could not get it done. That's how it started. For me, that's how the snowball effect started for Josh Freeman. Even in college and in his first few years with the Bucks, him and his team would always start off great, only for things to just hit a downward spiral and collapse right before his eyes. I get it. This is a 53-man team. It's a lot of varying factors. You can't put 100% of it on Josh Freeman. Whether the rumors were true or not about being a diva, throwing tantrums, missing photos, missing team meetings, whether they're true or not, these things were out there. So even if they were or weren't true, teams were most likely hesitant. They don't want to bring that negative energy into the locker room. Just a lot of things that make you question this guy's character, his leadership, whether fair or unfair. Because he proved that with, even with talent, I mean, Mike Williams and Kellen Winslow are not top tier players. But with them, he did perform very well. I am a believer that Greg Schiano was never in on Josh Freeman. And the final dagger being that Vikings-Giants game. At that point, everyone saw the writing on the wall. Overall, things were not necessarily in Freeman's favor in the NFL, but he really didn't do anything to make his situation better. Yes, he wasn't a bust like Jamarcus Russell, but then again, he was nowhere near a big Ben Roethlisberger or even a Josh Allen. It always makes you wonder, had he given a little more effort here, we get a little more effort there. Could it be a little bit different? I did my best to try to find things about Freeman post 2018, but nothing really comes up. He seems to have gone to a very quiet life, and some players do just prefer that, just living quietly and peacefully amongst themselves. He doesn't have an Instagram. He is hasn't been 
active on Twitter for a very long time. The only thing I could find that he was apparently interested in joining the FBI, but after that, I can't find anything. And just to kind of close the chapter on the Buccaneers, the Bucks finished 2 and 14 firing Greg Schiano. In 2015, they do draft Jameis Winston and yada 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 throws the famous 30 for 30. Jameis Winston isn't necessarily the story but he is the bridge between my story of Josh Freeman and what the Bucks are as of today. So that's gonna do it y'all thank you guys so much for watching if this is your first time on the channel feel free to drop a like comment subscribe turn those notifications on we are very close to reaching our 1000 sub mark Thank you guys for your support, and if there's a player out there you guys want me to cover, leave it in the comments. Who knows? I might do this a little bit more often. Hope you guys enjoyed, and if you want to check the Achilles Smith one out, I'll leave it at the end. Till next time, shaboy! The team that Freeman initially verbally communic- The team that Freeman initially verbally committed- Committed? Now, you know what? The Bucks have a year- They've had a year- now under the, now under, nonetheless, uh, uh, one of the biggest, t one of the biggest turns for the, one of the biggest problems that